Hello and welcome to PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale History, where today we will be looking at a forgotten legend, the hero of Calomir, Sir Daniel Fortescue. In the year 1286, an evil sorcerer named Zarok invaded the peaceful land of Calomir with his armies of the undead. King Peregrine sent his greatest soldiers into battle with his best knight Sir Daniel Fortescue on the front line. Sir Dan led the charge and defeated Zarok, dying heroically to save his kingdom. Or at least that's what the legend says anyway. In reality, Dan was a coward who was a more skilled croquet player than a knight, elevated to his position just because he was able to make the king laugh. But legends have a tendency of embellishing things. One hundred years later, Zarok came back and raised another undead army. However, in the process, he also resurrected a certain so-called hero. It has risen again, Sir Daniel Fortescue, see? The hero of Galomir who fell at the first charge. The fog of war and the shrouds of time conspired to turn the arrow fodder into the saviour of the day. But we know it's better. <laughs> Let it alone. Fate has given it a second chance. A chance to forget the ignoble truth. A chance to defeat Zarok and live up to the legend. We hope it does well. And this is where Medieval comes in. Released back on the PS1 in 1998, Medieval was the adventures of an undead sedan as he battles to truly overcome Zarek and live up to the reputation history has given him. His game was an action-adventure title mixing platforming, sword combat, and other elements to produce a very Tim Burton-esque title. It gained cult success to the point where it gained a sequel where Dan is resurrected again in Victorian London, and a remake on the PSP in 2005 which was less well received. The game was loved for its gallows humour and quirky heart style, and because of Dan himself, a clumsy and cowardly character whose heart is in the right place, assuming it hasn't already decomposed. Why his inclusion in All-Stars? Well, he's one of the representatives of the PlayStation 1, a first-party character with modest cult success and much loved by those who remember him, and his inclusion was a very welcome surprise to these fans. So let's take a look back at him. First off, let's take a look at a piece of art produced for the first game as promotional material and an image featured on loading screens. It featured Dan crouched down on one knee, holding his sword which is pinned into the ground. This became an intro in PlayStation All-Stars where Dan stands from this position. Dan's primary weapon, being a medieval knight, was a broadsword which he carried rather clumsily around with him. His primary attack in the original game was a three-hit combo consisting of two swings and a stab which he would use to chop zombies into bits. There was also a secondary move where Dan swung the sword in a circle this move could be charged up for greater range. Throughout the game, Dan could pick up better swords, switching from a small sword to a broad sword that could be enchanted for extra strength, up to a magic sword that can swipe through a shadow demon like butter. With later swords, Dan's combo would also change to a downward swing instead of a stab. The basic combo from the later swords and the stab from the small sword have been separated into two different attacks in PlayStation All-Stars, and he's also been given his spin move, which for some reason is no longer chargeable. The other sword moves in All-Stars are either original or based on the slightly more complex moveset in Resurrection but I don't have the footage for this unfortunately, and I'd rather not go into resurrection too much. On his other arm, Dan carried a shield. In Dan's crypt you could pick up a copper shield which is small and lightweight. It was also easily damaged and if you broke it you would have to pick up a new one. This later gets dropped for the silver shield which is larger and can take more damage before it's destroyed and needs to be replaced. And then you receive this reward from the Hall of Heroes. Ah, Herr Fortescue, you are back on the battlefield, yeah? This is good. People say to me, Stungar, what do you think of this sword or that axe? But I say to them, NINE! Modern warfare is a question of science! The science of shields! <laughs> I think maybe you should take my shield, yeah? It is magic here for this cure. Some say it is better to have a magic sword than a magic shield, but I say to you that this is rubbish! So long as you use it properly, the shield will make you invincible! The gold shield was larger and sturdier and generally pretty awesome. If it broke, you could also get it repaired instead of rummaging around for a new one, which was also pretty handy. The shield was 
kind of useful in the medieval games. Dan could defend against pretty much anything until it broke, which could be useful considering how many things were actively trying to murder you relentlessly. It just had to be used sparingly due to the breakability. The gold shield is also in PlayStation All-Stars, and Dan can pull it out to gain protection from projectile attacks. Just like its original form, it can only take a certain amount of damage before it breaks and needs to be replaced, which mercifully is much easier to do with the simple press of the circle button. The shield button in Medieval also gained a second use after the first few levels. After defeating the Guardians of the Graveyard, Dan unlocked the Daring Dash move, where he would rush forward with his shield in front of him, acting as a human battering ram. Well, a skeletal battering ram, I guess. It wasn't the most useful offensive move, but it did come in handy when it came to dodging or just generally moving quickly. It was just generally a nice move to have around. This dash is a part of Dan's moveset in PlayStation All-Stars as well, and it comes in two flavours. If Dan uses it without the shield, hitting an opponent results in Dan bouncing back briefly, but using it with the shield turns Dan into an unstoppable force, charging through opponents with great force, and becomes very, very useful. But it wasn't just swords and shields. Throughout the game, you could obtain weapons from the Hall of Heroes, a mystical place with special entry requirements where great heroes of old celebrated their afterlife. Chatting to the various heroes tended to result in Dan getting some rather nice prizes. Ah, Fortescue! What's this I hear about that Archcad Zarog still being alive? Thought you killed the fella! <laughs> Never mind, you old warhorse. Better show him what's what, eh? I expect Johnny Zombie's a bit more of a handful than you remember. How are you doing for weapons? <laughs> Here, take my war hammer. It'll smash anything and it won't fall apart like a club. I only ever get to use it cracking walnuts around this place. <laughs> Nonsense, Fortescue. I won't take no for an answer. Knock a few heads for old Stanyar Iron Hewer, eh? The Warhammer was a replacement for the club, an early weapon that you could find in chests and use to break stuff, but the smashy fun ended pretty quickly since the club was breakable. The Warhammer, however, was not, and the smashy fun could continue forever as long as you have it equipped. It also had a secondary attack where Dan could charge up the hammer and slam it down to create a shockwave. This made it even better and cemented its place as one of the best weapons. It appears in Dan's PlayStation All-Stars moveset too, where it's good for smashing around and generally causing problems for your opponents. It can't be charged up, but using it from high in the air does result in a small shockwave, so that's handy. Look at you running around in your bones, Fortescue. You're so nouveau dead. I, Ravenhooves, last prince of the centaurs, have not galloped the earth in over 10,000 years. Do yourself a favor, Fortescue. Take my longbow. More powerful than a crossbow. The option of flaming arrows? It is truly the weapon of noblemen. Congratulations! You don't quite have my breeding, Mr. Johnny come lately, but there's hope for you yet. Where would a great medieval warrior be without a longbow? Nowhere, that's where, and so Stan gained a longbow from the campus centaur in the world. As the game progressed, you could also equip flaming arrows and magic arrows, and these were naturally better because they did more damage. Magic arrows are what we're most interested in because they were basically amazing, capable of taking down tough shadow demons in a single shot. They are also somewhat explosive, so you can imagine how useful that was. The magic longbow makes an appearance in PlayStation All-Stars, only it's not quite the destructive force it was in its original form. Instead, you can trap a character in the air with it, stunning them briefly. It's quite a sneaky anti-air move, and one that can easily be comboed into Dan's level 1. Hey, Mr. Fortiske! I want to talk with you! If this Zorak's so bad, why'd you get to go back? Why'd you of all people for this game? It should be I, Blood Monath, Skull Cleaver. When I lived, always I had a pile of slain strewn around me. You, you spend most of your time organizing and changing all the guard and playing croquet with the king. Still, I lend you my axe. You a swing her, you a throw her. She thirsts for a slaughter as much as I. Drink deep of demon blood, my proud beauty. 
The axe was an interesting weapon. While it was basically a super short range melee weapon primarily, your sword was better at this purpose so it generally wasn't used in this manner. However, its secondary attack was a boomerang move where Dan would throw the axe ahead of him, taking out anyone it hit on its way out before boomeranging back to him. Even better, it could even cause damage on its way back for even more destructive fun. The axe appears in just its throwable form in PlayStation All-Stars, where Dan again uses the axe as a boomerang. It even retains its ability to damage on return, allowing for some interesting combo opportunities if you can time it right. And then the weapons in Medieval started to get weird. Oh lovely, lovely Amber. Here you are tonight. A wart covered and cabbage smelling old crone I may be, but I always keep my promises. I grant you my reward. After clearing out the ant caves and giving a witch some amber, you got a set of chicken drumsticks that you could throw. It sounds utterly useless until you realise that when you threw them at certain enemies, the enemies would actually turn into roast chicken. Even better, picking up the roast chicken would heal Dan, so it was actually pretty useful after all, except it didn't work on every enemy. The chicken drumstick makes an appearance in PlayStation all stars and sadly it's now become useless again. The drumstick has a wide arc and naturally no longer has the ability to turn whoever it hits into Christmas dinner. It's also quite slow, so I'm not really sure what purpose it serves now. A few levels later, Dan then encountered a rather obvious ripoff of the Sean Connery voiced dragon from the forgettable Dragonheart movie that was semi popular at the time. After dropping rocks on the dragon's head, the dragon gave Dan a reward. The dragon potion was awesome. Equipping it changed Dan's armor into a funky green dragon costume and allowed him to breathe fire as much as he wanted. Definitely one of the best weapons of the game, and the armor also gave Dan immunity to fire. The dragon potion also appears in PlayStation All Stars. Instead of permanently turning Dan into a dragon knight, Dan uses it to breathe a single blast of fire that litters the stage for a brief period of time, and he gains AP from any fighter that steps into it. It also provided a costume for Dan, which is a nice place to start discussing costumes. The dragon costume became Dan's unlockable outfit in PlayStation All Stars. It takes on very much the same look, although Dan can still use his normal weapons while using it. The purple variant of this costume may be subtly referencing a certain heavily requested dragon who also happened to be purple. But don't quote me on this. It may also be referencing Dan's gentlemanly suit from Medieval 2 that allowed him to blend in with Victorian society a little better. Dan's default costume, meanwhile, takes its cue from Medieval Resurrection, using the gloves from Medieval 2 to... <clears throat> flesh things out a little. It also has an alt that seems closer in colour to his armour in the original Medieval. The final costume, released as a pre-order and later DLC, is based on the golden armour Dan wore in the later portions of Medieval 2. The reasons for this armour's existence are spoiler heavy and we don't really need to get into them. This armour also seems to be the inspiration for the yellow variants of the other two costumes, and conversely Dan's armours from the first Medieval and Resurrection seem to inspire alts for this one. Speaking of crossover alt colours, each costume has a red and yellow variant which seems very similar to the colours worn by Zarek the villain in the original Medieval. In the second Medieval game, Dan found himself in Victorian times fighting off a cockney bloke who discovered Zarek's spellbook. He also found himself the victim of a possessed seagull. You lost your head, Dan. Swing between head and body using L1 plus triangle. If you find your head, L1 plus triangle will put it back on. When Dan recovered his head, it became a permanent ability to use his head as an item. A few levels later, Dan also gained the ability to attach his head to little green hands that wandered around Victorian London for some reason. Placing Dan's head on a hand allowed you to scuttle around in small places that normal Dan couldn't reach, leading to secrets that netted you more money and health and other goodies. Not only has Dan's head removal ability been referenced in one of his intros, the green hand itself also became a move in PlayStation All-Stars. For some reason, the hand has become a suicide bomber, scuttling towards an opponent and exploding in a puff of green, causing a stun effect. I have no idea why. So, as usual, before we move on to the supers, let's take a quick recap of all of that. Level 1! Daniel, there you are! 
I was so worried about you. <coughs> I know you have the heart of a hero, Daniel. Now we must show the others. Would you like to take my magic lightning bolts? I don't have many, but they're very powerful. <coughs> Off you pop then, and keep your chin up. <coughs> Oops, sorry Daniel. Now take care. The good people of Galamir are depending on you. The lightning was quite possibly the best weapon you could obtain in medieval. It was powerful and it spread along a wide area, meaning you could clear a room of enemies in seconds. The major downside was that it was limited in stock and could never be refilled, so it had to be used sparingly so you didn't run out. As a powerful ability that couldn't be used constantly, the lightning has naturally become Dan's level 1 super in PlayStation All-Stars, only it's been toned down a little bit. Now less likely to fill a room with lightning, instead it's just a single lightning bolt shooting from Dan's hand. It also requires some serious effort to get it to hit, so probably isn't the most useful super in the game. Level 2! In Medieval, the Chalice was one of the most important things you could encounter. Usually found in secret places, the Chalice was basically a giant floating golden goblet. There was one in each level, although initially Dan was unable to pick it up since it was transparent and ghostly. However, every time you killed an enemy, their soul would float out of them in the form of a red orb with a spectral trail, and each of these souls would be collected by the Chalice. Collect enough souls and the Chalice became obtainable. <laughs> This granted access to the Hall of Heroes, where you obtained all the weapons we talked about today. So it was definitely worth picking up, although some were definitely easier than others. It also had another use. We never thought you'd get this far. Your final encounter with Zarek awaits beyond this point. He has surrounded himself with his unnatural bodyguards, but you may yet even the odds by calling upon the lost souls collected within your chalice. Place the chalice on the shield at the heart of the arena. Good luck, Sir Daniel Fortescue. In the final battle against Zarek, Dan brought a chalice with him and placed it in the arena, freeing many souls trapped inside. These souls turned into skeletal soldiers looking to fight along Dan... For the honour of Galomir! Yes, exactly. The first part of the fight against Zarek was then just using a special form of lightning to keep your soldiers healed as they hacked away at Zarek's army. And that's basically where Dan's level 2 comes from. Dan will pull out a chalice from his game and free all the souls inside, much like at the start of Zarek's fight. They don't turn into skeletal soldiers, however, but they do float around like souls in medieval and hone in on Dan's opponents. The chalice also pops up in one of Dan's victory animations, which may also be a reference to the original medieval's good ending, where he celebrates in the Hall of Heroes and tries to drink from a chalice but doesn't do a good job for obvious reasons. LEVEL 3! Well, I suppose we have to talk about Medieval Resurrection. Released in 2005 for the PSP, Resurrection was a poorly received remake of the original game. Some naysayers like to believe that Dan in All Stars is based entirely on Resurrection, but the designs of the Warhammer and Chalice say otherwise, and I could easily merrily avoid discussing that game for much of this video. That said, I can't avoid it completely as much as I'd like to. So where Dan used his Chalice to summon an unholy army to defeat Zarek in the original game, he needed something else in the remake. Help you fight Zarok? Of course. If only to get some rest. I'd be off on holiday topping up my town if it wasn't for that evil old madman. But there is a way to stop him. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll need the Anubis Stone. It was used by Zarok a hundred years ago to create an undead army. The very army that you fought on the day of your, uh, arrow-based mishap. After that most bloody of battles, the Galamir people acquired the stone. To prevent its power being used again for evil, they broke it into four and gave each piece to a trusted member of the realm. Much of Resurrection concerned Dan chasing after the pieces of the Anubis Stone before he could go and kick Zarek's bony ass. However, when he used the Anubis Stone, it basically acted exactly the same as the Chalice from the first game, summoning an army to fight along Dan. Yes, that's enough of that clip now. The Anubis Stone in PlayStation All-Stars is a bit different, since now it's gained an orb around Dan that causes damage to his opponents as they fall into the orb. This is new, since there wasn't really anything like this in Resurrection. So does that cover it? I, I think that covers it.
fact, I think that's enough to cover Sedan, and I'd say we're pretty much finished. I'll see you next time.